Good day, this is Chen Paitel from Columbia Gorge Community College Renewable Energy Technology Program, ET121 Digital One. Today we are going to discuss some troubleshooting of IC circuits. Uh, your book has this awesome section in 3-8 called Troubleshooting, and this is something that I really wish my ET113 guys could just read this one sentence. To be an effective troubleshooter, you must understand how the circuit is supposed to work. And honestly, guys, if you could get through that, that, that thing through, you are going to be so much better for troubleshooting. You got to understand what the output should be for given inputs. So you don't know if it's going wrong if you don't know what the output's supposed to be. Okay, so there are certain common failures for uh, IC circuits, not so common, but you should be aware of these things. Um, given a, uh, remember our, our chip, I know you've got all these pins on the outside. The chip inside is actually this little tiny thing. And these guys are connected to it by tiny wires. And sometimes those wires break off. Okay, what happens when something's break broken off on the inside? It's given an output, or excuse me, it's basically, here's our, let's pretend we're dealing with an AND gate. What happens when this wire breaks? It's supposed to be carrying signal A, and there's signal B coming in. What happens if it breaks right there? This thing becomes a high. This is, again, this is for TTL, um, not for CMOS. When it breaks right there, that becomes a high. So even though signal A could be having this pulsed operation on it, what's coming out here on this side is a steady high signal. Okay, now B has got a signal that looks like this. Okay, now, according to our timing diagram, we would expect something to look like this. Let me align these things. So that's a little prettier there. So we would expect, given the operation of A and B, we would expect our signal X to be the output there to look something like this. There you go. Whereby X is high right here, and we are simultaneously high, and right here. But because of this break right here, we're getting a high signal the whole time on A. So A, in reality, looks like this. So it's a constant high the whole time. And our X, our output, looks like this. Exactly like signal B. So, this is almost like the enable and inhibit example I gave you guys earlier. I'm going to push to talk about it. So A is constantly high. It means the signal B is enabled and it's allowing it to be passed through. So you need to recognize the fact that, okay, this signal X that I'm getting is not what I expect. Okay, so this is just highlighting the fact that a TTL, when there's a break inside that chip, it's going to go too high. Okay. So this also illustrates the fact that an AND gate is acting as an enable or an inhibit. Same thing with a NAND gate. So this can be used. Uh, the NAND gate would have an inverted signal output. So if this is, you do it as an example. I'll show you guys um, some other stuff. Okay, an AND gate. This also gives us a good example. Say we've got an AND gate that we are suspecting of giving us a bad, um, excuse me, a bad, uh, a bad input here. One of these, one of these inputs are broken. So what we can do is hook one of these to five volts and apply a signal to it. The other one, i.e., pulsar. Remember our logic pulse that we talked about earlier? Okay, what happens here? is if this push to talk is ena enabled here, 
basically that A. It's going to go like that. But now if this thing's broken, if this internal connection is broken here, if we have nothing to this gate, the output is going to still be the exact replica of B. Okay, even if this is zero volts there, this break here causes a high, and we're getting that enable. Okay, now what would happen if second, we hooked it up in the following manner, whereby B was provided a 5-volt signal, and we pulsed the input of A. And now if it was functioning properly, we would expect this. But if there was a break in A, this right here would be a 5, and we would get a constant high output. Okay, So that's a pretty neat uh, troubleshooting, knowing full well that a break to the internal inputs. We're talking internally. I'm not. I'm, this is not troubleshooting your circuit. You are on your own in that one. I'm talking about these connections inside the chip. These things are connections here on your proto board that you've got all your wires hooked to. You are on your own for troubleshooting these things, guys. And we talked about that in lab four. Excuse me, lab three. Some of the organizational techniques and how to how to make that simple. I'm talking internal of the chip. The other thing that I wanted to bring up here was the logic chip checker. We do have that that uh, that device in the lab. Basically, all you do is you put your device in the holes there, slam it down, put in 7400. That's the 7400 that you want to test, and go ahead, test execute, bang, and it says fail or pass. So basically it's giving you it's giving all combinations of inputs and it's testing the outputs and it either fails it or passes it. So one way to ensure the fact that you get something wrong is if you pick up a chip and it's a 7410 and you put in it as a 7400 and you go ahead and say okay I'm going to test the 7400 